Hi, everybody. Welcome to yet another Beyond Now webinar series from Porto Business School. As you know, every Tuesday at 6 p.m., uh, we gather uh, friends, experts, uh, people that can help us to figure out and navigate this current um, situation, this pandemic, to understand how we can not only survive, but also thrive after in the aftermath of uh, this uh, this situation. Uh, today, we are very happy to have a friend, a friend of the house, a friend of Porto Business School, uh, Professor Mark Fritz. Mark is a leadership uh, specialist. He has been a junk professor here at Porto Business School for many years, also teaching in IE Business School, uh, HEC Paris. He has a long, he had a long career at Kodak, and uh, he has also a, a, a great number of followers here in, at Porto Business School, alumni that uh, do cherish this relationship, this ongoing relationship, and, and Mark really nurtures relationships with students, which is something outstanding. We all get get um, get his insights uh, on a frequently basis, and and we we thank you for that, Mark. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much thank for you. taking the time. And, and I know that you're safe in London. We were just talking before uh, we started the show. So let me just uh, um, start uh, a little bit or set the scene. Um, it's safe to say that nearly. Every leader has been faced with moments of crisis, of uncertainty, when decisions are hard, that can range from brief, brief bumps into, 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 into the road to more sustained issues. It's also safe to say that the current crisis uh, involving the COVID-19 pandemic is different than anything that we have ever faced in, in, in perhaps over a century. Um, it, it's one that looks to be a prolonged and possibly existential challenge for uh, organizations. So we're not dealing with only uncertainty. The duration of uncertainty is uncertain as well. So lots of variables, lots of, uh, lots of dimensions that leaders need to address. And effective leadership in a prolonged crisis with such serious consequences is absolutely necessary for an organization and for its people. It requires physical, psychological, and emotional fortitude. And... And especially now that we had to send our people home, they are working remotely, they are working remotely while they have to take care of their children that also are having classes remotely. There are multiple uh, variables where uh, one's uh, uh, professional performance is uh, under pressure. And at the same time, the leader that needed to uh, worry about protecting its people, protecting its community, now also has to, do, to worry about the continuity of the business and how will the business survive. So, Mark, can we effectively and successfully lead anyone from anywhere? That is the question. <laughs> That's a very good one. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think it requires uh, true leadership skills. I think the people that are struggling now are the micromanagers because you can't really micromanage people at a distance. You, you can't see what they're doing. Uh, you really have to lead people to take ownership for what they need to achieve. Uh, if you're a micromanager in this environment now, you probably have a very full inbox and uh, all kinds of emails coming back. Uh, but it presents uh, opportunities now because if you're very good at leading people from anywhere, uh, in the future, you can leverage talent from anywhere. and You're not really restricted to, to where you are. So, I think um, this is an opportunity to grow leaders everywhere, I think, right now in this environment because it requires it. It requires leadership versus micromanaging. And to be honest, in this environment, you know, micromanagement comes with a speed limit because if you're operating to your head speed to tell everybody what to do, uh, you're operating too slow. And uh, the people that are empowering, their, the leaders that are empowering their people uh, is, is the key. And I think you mentioned an interesting thing in that, uh, you know, it's so much uncertainty. Uh, but it's the leader's job to create enough uncertainty for the next few weeks so that people can take action on their own. Because if they can't take action on their own, they're always back to the leader. And the leader's providing all the answers and the team slows down. So I think, uh, you know, while, you know, every problem creates an opportunity, uh, every different environment creates uh, the requirement for people to adapt and change. Oh, can't hear you. 
Yeah, the the the, <laughs> the, the uncertainties of muting and unmuting. That's um, it. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, a great skill that we need to master uh, in this in the during these crazy times. But I, I was mentioning, um, you are a professor of leadership. You have been uh, teaching um, the the characteristics, the traits, the skills that leaders uh, needs uh, needs to present. You have you have a methodology that is is famous here uh, all over the world, and, and that we cherish a lot here at Porto Business School. From 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 your approach to leadership, from the, those characteristics, from those specific traits and skills, which are the ones that are at this moment should be in some sense prioritized. So you have to calibrate, you know, you have to, 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 to mix the different traits and different characteristics, which are the ones that are, that become more relevant, more urgent in a, a circumstance like this? Yeah, in a, in a circumstance like this, uh, uh, all the leaders have to be more outcome focused. I mean, you have to get people to, to own the key outcomes uh, and you have to enable them to be able to take action and make decisions and collaborate more on their own because you can't be in the middle of everything at a distance. And um, the easiest way to think about outcome versus activity focus and so forth is to think about what you hear when everybody sets up a meeting. You know, when everybody sets up a meeting, they say, we need a meeting to discuss something. And, and discussion is an activity, it's not an outcome. And the best thing you can do as a leader leading people from anywhere is to run very good meetings and be very clear at the top of the meeting what you want to achieve. That means, uh, you know, uh, what decision do you want to make? What action do you want to agree on? What alignment do you need so that everybody can take action uh, that way? Uh, the second thing that really requires leaders is they have to be what I call, uh, they have to lead NIFO, nose in, fingers out. Uh, their nose has to be in. They have to understand what's going on. They can't be surprised at things, but they're not telling their people what to do because if you tell your people what to do, they get the easy answer. They come back and they'll want the easy answer the next time. Or, uh, you know, uh, you're always telling them what to do. You're saving them from thinking. So you're not growing your people that way too. So I think um, it requires a lot more uh, sort of smaller interaction sometimes, but asking questions so that you're comfortable that people are clear on, on what they need to do. And the easiest way to get clear uh, and to, to feel that you're in, in control and people are doing things is ask your people for the milestones. Ask your people for what steps they need to take. And if they give you good answers, you can probably let go a little more uh, that way. But the third thing, too, I think, is collaboration. You need them able to collaborate on their own without you having to be in the middle to drive every conversation. And I've used collaboration in three things. Uh, trust. You know, people need to trust each other. Information sharing. They have to share information because they can't hold on to it. And the information has to be visible everywhere, meaning location independent. It has to be digital and so forth. And the third one is you need some processes that hold it together. Those three I used to call glue. And in fact, when I was leading dispersed teams for a number of years, we had a, a brainstorm every quarter and we asked ourselves the question, we said, how's our glue? <laughs> is there something we need to improve in trust, how we're sharing information or in processes, right? But if you think about all those three, um, the, the real key thing about anything when, when, you're, when you want people to take action is they need enough clarity to take action on their own. That's your goal as a leader. Um, you know, it's interesting. When I was towards the end of my leadership, I figured out my leadership has to be this. You know, my job is to create the environment where the right conversations are happening with the right people about the right topics, and I'm not in them. <laughs> because if I have to be in the middle of everything, then team speed is my speed. So I think, um, you know, you got to be out much more outcome focused, much more nose in, fingers out. And, and you also have to drive people to collaborate. And they need to be able to collaborate on their own. And I'll give you one particular thing I always look for in a, in a remote environment, virtual environment is I wanted people willing to pick up the phone or send a message quickly and resolve an issue real time. Meaning they weren't sending emails and they weren't copying the world to 
to do things because you you can see a poor organization. There's too many CCs, and and CCs is like a responsibility distributor. I don't want it all myself. I want to spread it to other people because I don't want to take the blame or whatever. So I think you know you really have to be more outcome focused, NIFO, and you got to get people to collaborate on their own without being in the middle of every conversation. Um, lots of those, lots of those uh, aspects that you just mentioned require empathy, require the ability to put oneself uh, in other people's shoes. It requires uh, uh, a comprehension and, 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 and um, a full understanding of human behavior. But how can you leverage that using virtual tools when, when you're not seeing, you don't have eyeball contact right now. And, uh, and I teach my students about eyeball contact and how important that is. You, the, nothing can replace that first, second body language reaction into a proposal, a suggestion, uh, uh, um, a KPI presentation or whatever. So how can we how can we still or even perhaps because the moment requires uh, amplify this empathy uh, though with this physical distancing that we are uh, uh, living in yeah yeah that's it, it, a good point you know what's really it, the start of empathy is not seeing the other person the start of empathy and everything is listening to the other people so they don't necessarily see have to see them all the time you have to listen And think about this. If, if someone doesn't listen to you, how do you feel? You know, you don't feel great. You know, listening values the other person. And in this time, um, we can't just have uh, operational meetings. We have to call people up and say, how are you doing? How's everything going? And actually just listen to people. And I found that leadership is much easier when you listen because you, you get to see what your people are thinking and feeling. I found if I'm trying to guess what my people are thinking and feeling, I'm always less than 50% if I'm guessing. If I'm asking questions and listening, it's, it's much better. And I think um, the virtual environment is interesting now. Everybody says, I got to be on Zoom. And every meeting is a Zoom. But to be honest, not every meeting needs face-to-face -face and video. Sometimes a quick phone call addressing an issue in five minutes is much more productive than jumping on a a Zoom. And I'll, I'll give you an instance where I run leadership programs. And I've been running a leadership program for a Spanish bank over the last six months. And 99% of my coaching sessions were just on the phone with no video. You'd be imagine, you, you, you can't imagine how much you can understand in someone's voice as well, you know, in terms of inflection, if they, if they hesitate, If you know they're slow speaking, you can judge a lot from voice too. So I think sometimes we over rely on on the video. And I'll give you another thing that sometime in a virtual organization is difficult is some people are self conscious, so they're worried about how they look on the video and they're not thinking as clearly. Uh, you're better off getting them on a phone and so forth. So if you think about this as a general rule. Um, and I teach this a lot in leadership, the word same is, is bad. So as a leader, if you're using the same way of communicating all the time, it's not good. You have to be consistently different. So sometimes you use video. Sometimes you have a big meeting. Sometimes you break the small groups. Sometimes you have quick phone calls. All these things are very powerful. Um, but there's another thing that you have to be very careful in leadership at a distance and anywhere is think about this, distance multiplies. In other words, the emotion. Let's say that uh, we have an argument and then I don't talk to you for a week. You're making this issue bigger and bigger every day. To me, it still stays this small, but the next time I talk to you in five days, the issue is this big in your mind and it's only this. In your mind. So distance multiplies. If something bad happens, call up, reset people. You don't have the, 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 the chat about football at the coffee machine to kind of neutralize what has happened. So keep that in mind in terms of distance multiplies both the good and the bad that way. And you want to, you know, engage people. So as a leader, you have to listen more when you lead virtual people. But it doesn't mean that you spend all your day listening and not getting anything done. So therefore, what does it mean? 
it means you have to be asking very good questions. Your best prep as a leader is the questions you need to ask your people. So the better the questions, the more you know. And then the other thing is be careful giving answers. Don't give direct answers. Give them a story or an example that they can learn from the context of that and, and maybe apply that to other things too. So I think empathy is great and the, the start is always listening. Cool. We already have some uh, of your former students here, for your alumni, uh, chatting a little bit on our chat box. And Pedro Souza from uh, EMBA, uh, in, in his leadership course, is, re is reminding you that his leadership course assessment was to create a model of leading a virtual and remote working team exactly. based on different country, countries. So spot on. Uh, uh, um, very good capacity of of, of, of transporting and and and, uh, and foresight. Um, and, and I want to tell our audience, of course, that. Uh, uh, in a few minutes, we'll start taking also questions uh, uh, that uh, you can put on our chat box, and I will uh, um, uh, uh, read some of them uh, uh, for Mark. Mark, um, on one hand, what we are what we are experiencing, and here in Portugal, it has been for us six weeks now in in, in lockdown. Uh, on one hand, we see some productivity uh, enhancing because we are much more straight to the point. We don't chit chit chat chit chat about football. Actually, there's no football to chit chat about, which is also <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but but we're going straight to the point. Exactly. Meetings are becoming much more effective, much more productive. Um, but on the other hand, can, isn't there a danger of losing the serendipitous part of of casual interaction or social social interaction? Yes. Uh, I always. I always tell my students the story of, of how Nokia in the golden age uh, had the coffee machine as a place for serendipitous innovation because, as you know, Finns love coffee. They consume lots of coffee. And while they were in the queue uh, waiting for their coffee refill, they were really cross-fertilizing. They yeah. were they were yeah. sharing and so on. So how can we, how can we uh, uh, um, I wouldn't say fight that, uh, uh, that effect of the loss, the, the losing serendipitous contact, but how can we try to make this serendipitous contact or mimic or come up with other alternatives that can, uh, in some sense, uh, allow us for um, uh, growing with this interaction? I'm not talking about the chit-chat. I'm talking in the, in the middle of the chit-chat. Every now and then, you get to know what the other part of the company is doing, what that team is, is, is performing, and there might be uh, intersections. How could we uh, um, do this? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, first thing when you mentioned is it, more productive uh, virtually. I found that when you drive the right collaboration and you, people get to know each other well, uh, being anywhere is more productive than being in the office. <laughs> it, it definitely is. Uh, uh, just my experience many years ago when I started this virtual thing, uh, my most uh, productive people were uh, young mothers. Uh, because, uh, you know, they would start late, they would leave early, but they were on uh, the PC at night and everything. Uh, I'll tell you, the most important thing I used to do to encourage the chit-chat is to get everybody to understand their common interests, okay? So you always have a conversation starter. And so sometimes you, you start a meeting at the beginning of the week and say, what did everybody do this weekend? And you go around and suddenly they, they see that they've been doing similar things, okay? Of course, football's a common interest. Uh, children the same age, a common interest, food, wines, all these things. But the more you do that, um, an interesting I used, thing I used to do when I had my first virtual group, and now this is back in 2000, okay, many years ago, uh, we, we did a day in the life. So we had people doing a day in the life uh, of what their life was, both at work and at home during a day. And it, what they find is that there's similarities and they have a conversation starter the next time they talk business together. And you need to encourage one-on-one -on -one conversations around it. And people need a conversation starter because if you don't have a conversation starter to create rapport, you won't take an issue up face-to-face -face or on a Zoom or on a call. You'll, you'll send an email. So I found that you're almost like a corporate matchmaker. You want to get everybody to understand their, their common interest and trigger people to talk to each other a lot more. Uh, you definitely can't totally replace it. 
you, you, you need an occasional, maybe every few months or three to four months, uh, a get together. And particularly you need something like a dinner because you, you don't learn anything nine to five. You learn between, you know, 10 PM and 3 AM in the morning <laughs> where people get to know each other. Yeah, um, because physical distancing, and, and I've been fighting the idea of social distancing, because actually, I think that um, most likely, uh, we have been closer to each other than, than ever. We have been, I've been in yeah. touch with people I haven't met in, 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 many, in, in many years, sometimes just to try to check out, and the way the communities have been supporting each other. So uh, I've been fighting that idea of social distancing. It is, of course, physical distancing, yeah. but of course, there's the physical distancing also leads to this lack of of interaction, of more casual and serendipitous uh, uh, interaction. Before I, I already see some 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 questions, um, and I want to wrap this this part of the of the of the conversation. Then I want to move towards uh, slightly something different. Um, uh, uh, and how how do you bring this? How do you bring this aspects of leadership? And I think this is connected to one question that I have from. Uh, Flavio Forty One. Uh, well, that's the 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 the, the, the login name. Um, how do we bring these ideas to your current line manager, to the operational managers, to people that are still under pressure? Um, because people think that because everybody everybody or lots of people are now working remotely, uh, that the pressure is lower. No, the pressure is is super so, high. Yeah. So so how do you bring this to? Um, uh, the different layers of, of uh, hierarchy inside the organization and make them understand that even if they are a line manager or a unit manager, their leadership is still very important. And leadership is also uh, a function required. Um, yeah. How do you bring that? Yeah, you know, if you think about it, you know, uh, the best leaders are teachers. <laughs> you know, they're, they're teaching it that way. And the best teacher can be a role model. And I think uh, unless unless leaders are role modeling it down through the organization and they're just saying this is what you should be doing, it doesn't really happen. Um, a funny thing occurred to me. I used to live in Japan and I was only in Japan. I lived about five years or so, but I was only there for like two weeks. And a lady was walking through push car, pushing a cart each day, selling tea, coffee, snacks. And she brings a young girl with her. And the girl was uh, was her daughter. Well, I didn't know how to say daughter in English. She didn't know how to say daughter in Japanese. And she says, this is my copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you want people to change, you have to provide a good person to copy. And I think um, a great question I always ask leaders when I'm coaching them in organizations, they say, what is the one or two key behaviors you want your leaders below you to copy? And, and that's the best way to get it through. So, you know, if, if a leader starts uh, some informal chat in, in, in the before starting meetings, if the leader facilitates some of these things, the leaders below start to pick that up and they do it within their organizations too. So I tell you, if, if you're running an organization, say, what is the one or two key behaviors that's so important in this type of environment now that I want my leaders to copy and then make sure you're doing it more consistently. I think that's the absolute key. Um, you know, if you just talk about it, you put it in a PowerPoint, people are going to ignore it, but they don't ignore behaviors and then they'll pick it up if it works and it, they, they just copy it and do it for their own organization. And suddenly it's down through the whole organization. Great. Um, let me let me uh, um, still uh, uh, a question uh, regarding the role of the leader uh, in terms of of the of culture. So, how do you work on organizational culture from the leadership perspective when people are remote? They are uh, working. Uh, so, uh, a huge a huge part of the symbolic aspect of an HQ, an office, a logo, a uniform is cultural integration, identification, uh, the the sense of belonging to a tribe, to a collective, to to whatever. And then suddenly, um, your your physical uh, three dimensional space around you has nothing to do with your company. Uh, it uh, it uh, reminds nothing of your company, and pretty much everything that you do is, um, in some sense, performing uh, a, a function. Uh, 
yeah. nothing, and that's your connection to, to the company. So how, from a leadership perspective, you make sure that you protect the organizational culture and that you reinforce identification and identity between the members of the organization and the organization itself. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, especially when you're moving to this type of environment, a conversation you really have to have is say, how do we live the values when we're not seeing each other all the time? What are the key behaviors that we, we need to, to work on? And I think the, the trouble I have with values is values is a non-word. You know, you can't see trust. You can only see the behaviors that demonstrate trust. You, you know, uh, Farfetch has a, a value, I think, ambition. You can't see ambition. You can only see the behaviors. So you, you have to talk about that. But there's one key thing you need to do in this environment is you need to have a few principles. Uh, and that's when we started the virtual working many years ago, we asked our team members to define what are the principles by which we should work together? How should we communicate to each other, given that we're all over the place? And they came back with different principles, particularly, and now this particular principle is many years ago, but if they got an email, they had to respond within eight hours. If they got a text message, they had to come back within the hour. And, and that was their agreements. But the thing is, is um, a culture is basically shared behaviors. It's an expectation of how you will behave and I will behave and we will do it more consistently. So now that you're working totally different and you're not in an office, the expectations need to change a little bit. And, and that's important. And I think linked to those expectations, it's so critical in terms of getting the best out of people. Now we have an advantage. People are home working. You know, they have their best times of day when they're most productive. They can utilize those and then deal with the kids in another time and so forth. So we need to be uh, aware of everybody's best times and we need to schedule our meetings around where we can keep our people the most productive. And those are like principles that we have to follow. And I found when you ask your people to define the principles, they take ownership of it. If the leader defines the principles, they feel that they're told and the natural instinct of human nature is to rebel, right? So I, I would get, uh, I would say the best thing is get some of your, your key people from across the organization and come up and say, what are the top five principles we need to, to live to make this environment work the best? That's a real good exercise. Great. A question from uh, from our audience, from, um, well, let me check it, from Edgar Silva. How can you remotely um, advert, call, it, call attention, motivate, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to look for the English word, to correct an underperformer? You're seeing someone remotely that is underperforming. How do you act? Uh, what is the best way to act as you don't have the physical contact and you're, you're doing it remotely? So um, what's your suggestion on that? Yeah, it, it, that's a good question. It comes back to all performance. I think uh, the first thing is performance has to be much more visible because you need peer pressure. You need to create an environment of peer pressure with, you know, think about this. Without peer pressure, all the pressure has to come from the leader. So things have to be much more visible to, to encourage the, the poor performer to deliver. But the other thing is, is that you have to have steps. You have to check up with the people periodically according to the milestones, because you should see ahead of time that this person might not be hitting their target or might not be delivering. And then it's when you have the conversation uh, to coach them. But let me, let me share a, a danger. Uh, many leaders, when you ask them, where do they spend their time? They'd say, oh, I always spend with my high performers who are driving the organization. But really what they're doing is they're spending all their time with the poorest performers. What I found is two things that help that. One is set an environment of positive peer pressure. But the second thing is try to find people in the organization to help the other person. Don't directly help the poor performer by yourself. Have someone else who can help them along the same way. And that becomes like almost the leader growing assignment. You know, they need to help someone within their team 
who maybe needs uh, more support. Because if, let me ask you this question. If, if everybody sees you always spending your most time with all the poor performers, what are the top performers feeling like? <laughs> they feel neg neglected. So um, I would say um, in a virtual environment, the first thing you need to do is you have to think about what performance metrics can I make visible? Because without visibility, you have no peer pressure and all the pressure has to come from you. Um, question from uh, Rosario Moreira, professor here at Porto Business School. Um, um, do you think that the leadership style, more or less directive, uh, more transformational, more inspiring um, of the leader determines the success of this virtual leadership? <laughs> It's a, that is a very interesting one. You know, um, to be honest, as a leader, you cannot determine your own style. Your people determine the leader you need to be to get the best from them. So you might have to be transformational with some. You might have to be very directive with others. But you're going to have to find a way to get the best performance from all those. I think the, the people that struggle, uh, the people that do very well in the short term are the micromanagers because they pressure people to get things done. But that pressure runs out. Uh, the best leaders are the ones who understand themselves because in a virtual environment, one person cannot be the perfect for everything. In other words, you can be visionary, but you have to put someone operational next to you to, to counteract some of your weaknesses that way. So I found that um, the first thing I do when I coach leaders sometimes is I say, who's your number two? And if the number two is exactly like the number one, <laughs> they've magnified all the strengths, but they've magnified all the weaknesses. So um, I would say that uh, it's, it's very good to have people around you who offset maybe some of the negatives you have in, in your own leadership style. But uh, let me say that again. You know, you don't determine how you're going to lead to get the best from your people. Your people determine who you need to be and what type of leader you need to be to get the best from them. Leadership uh, has always been heavily reliant on the, the power of communication. Yeah. And, um, but when you do this remotely, when you have a huge part of your company or, or your organization or even the, the whole organization uh, working remotely, which might be something new for them. So with all those uncertainties and all these all these ambiguities, communication uh, uh, um, uh, becomes even much more relevant and important. Okay. But of course, the kind of communication, the type of communication, the channels that you use, the kind of message, do you need to adjust? Do you need to fine tune also your communication uh, into this uh, 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 new context of full remote? Or it's communication as it always should be uh, uh, for the leader? I, I, I think you have to do the same things you, you have been doing. If you were a good leader, you're probably doing the same things when you're face-to-face -face too. Uh, but you have to be more strategic about it. And, and so when you're saying something in one meeting, you have to reinforce that same message in a follow-up call or an email and so forth. So you have to think about... Um, What I always used to say is, uh, how far does your influence have to travel? <laughs> you know, down through the organization and that. Um, but the, the most difficult people uh, in a virtual environment, I call those the, the two-steppers. Um, you have uh, one step and two-step people. You have one step, you can have the conversation with them. It's very clear. They're willing to commit and they commit right away. And then you have the two-steppers, and they need to they, they hear it, but they need to go away and think about it, and they need to sleep on it, or they need some time before they fully commit. And communication is an activity. The outcome is them committing and taking action for what you want them to do. So some leaders say, hey, I communicated. I'm done. They should know. But the two-steps need this follow-up to reinforce that commitment. And um, to be honest, I found at least 20 or 30% of my people were two-steppers. 
which means that you have to come back and reinforce the message sometimes, or you have to send the message to, to a few of those two-steppers before the meeting so you get everybody willing to commit right in the meeting. So be careful of that. You know, do a little brainstorm for your own teams, for the people on the call. You know, how many of those are two-steppers? You might have to do a little bit extra work because the goal is not communication. The goal is then getting them committed and taking action on what you're communicating. I think that's key. Cool. Now, we have an interesting question here because all of this, um, let's call it virtual leadership, relies heavily on technology. And we have a question here from uh, Merlin Inacio, uh, who is from Angola. What about in the developing countries where the technology, um, the, the broadband internet is less available? And, 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 and they are also in, uh, I'm Angolan also, so I know my parents are there and, and they have to rely on technology that not, it's not always that reliable, but still yeah. they have to manage companies that are working from home, uh, and, uh, uh, companies where people are working from home and they are in lockdown and so on. Uh, then it becomes tricky, right? It becomes an additional uh, challenge to the leader. Yeah, 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 definitely. You know, I mean, well, I started this uh, this type of uh, remote working, uh, you know, 25 years ago when the technology wasn't there and everything. Um, and we had basically uh, phone conference lines that we could use and things like that. Uh, but you need a glue. And, and what I found is uh, to get people connected, they had to be looking at the same piece of paper, the same document. And, and, and then you could focus the conversation that way. And in a virtual environment, there's another thing which really absolutely key is the power of one page. Because when you have to move screens and you're moving around, you're losing people. Every time you move, you lose a few. You have to have one summary slide or you have to have something that pulls people and they can see how it all connects. But I think in... It, the, the, the key for, if you don't have the technology, people have to look at the same document. And that becomes a channel to, to focus the conversations that way. Um, you know, if you think about it, leadership is, um, a lot of it is, is keeping your people focused and keeping your conversations focused. So, you know, to be honest, some of these technologies are just, not people focus. What is social media? Social media take is your people everywhere and they're losing, they're losing the focus on their job too. So I really think, um, you know, what is bringing them together is looking at something in a, in a common way. Yeah. Lots of questions, interesting questions here with that one from Cuba Pietras that takes us right to the beginning to the, to the, to, to, to the micromanagers. And what is the first thing that micromanagers should, should change now? What is the first step that will eventually get him him or her nose in? <laughs> well, the first thing is you have to you have to ask uh, you know better questions. You you know you, you uh, it's an interesting. I'll, I'll give you a, a story I tell when I'm teaching and everything. Um, when I used to to lead international operations, I always went to different countries and I asked the general manager, "Tell me your superstar." And who are your superstars? And I buy them a beer or lunch or a dinner or something, and I learn. And the top salesperson and the superstar uh, said this. He says, um, you know, uh, he says, I owe all my success in my sales to one phrase. If the prospect is talking, I'm winning. If the prospect is same in, in leadership. Uh, you move from micromanager to leader by asking the questions. But there's another factor which is really interesting in coaching leaders, especially in the last five to seven years. Um, you have to ask yourself, what do you need to feel in control? Because if you need to know everything for you personally to feel in control, it doesn't matter what behaviors you try. You're going to always ask about everything or you're going to want to know everything in reports because that's how you feel in control. And the other thing is interesting. Micromanagers. They tend to always like to participate in detail on the things they like to do. So they can't let go of the things they like. So they want to keep participating in all those. So I found the two barriers to being a good leader is what do you need to feel in control? And the second one is you have to delegate things you like to do. You have to, to grow your people to do those things. Um, but I, I tell you, 
if you're not asking questions and you're just telling your people what to do, you're never going to come out of it because some of those leaders get a buzz. You know, I tell them the answer. I feel a buzz. I'm the person who knows everything. And, and, you know, by asking questions, it's not the same buzz. You get a delayed buzz when they're doing all that work and you're getting home earlier for dinner, <laughs> you know? So that's the keys. Yeah. Putting the questions is empowering. It's empowering people to find their solutions, to build, to co-create the solutions internally. And, and the leader orchestrates. The leader doesn't only direct, doesn't only micromanage. Uh, a couple of questions here around the topic of motivation. From uh, Alba Henrique, these days, I believe one of the most difficult points of leadership is to keep up with the team motivation. What are your suggestions for leaders to sustain people's motivation? And another one from Andrea Nunes. Uh, how can a leader keep the motivation, inspiration, and enthusiasm of team members from a distance? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for sure, the, the, the top motivation is, is uh, you have to ask for their idea. <coughs> Excuse me. Because if it's never, your, never their idea, it's always yours, they don't feel they own it and everything. Um, uh, I think visibility. Visibility is very motivating. If everybody knows you did a great job, and you make it visible across the whole organization, uh, they have people feel pride. So they're going to feel much more uh, that way as well. Uh, but there's an underutilized uh, uh, concept, especially with your, your very good people, is uh, the, the best way I found to motivate them is to talk about their potential. Talk to them about And when you delegate things to them, show them how this is going to use their potential. Because what you're doing is they're using their strengths, but they're going to have to grow to improve some of the weaknesses. Because often when you use your potential, you have to improve your influencing skills or your communication skills this way. So I think there's no one size fits all. And, you know, certain people need recognition in that. And I think what's important is that you pick what per motivation is best for each of the, of the people you have. Uh, like I said before, the, the four-letter word of leadership is same. If you try to do the same thing, and that's what young leaders do. They say, I motivated this person. It worked really perfectly. So now I'll motivate everybody the same way, and, and it doesn't work. Um, but I think, you know, two, two, of the most, the, two of the most powerful P's of motivation is pride, visible, what you've achieved, and potential, because potential pulls you to grow more. That's what I call my two P's of the motivation. Uh, another question, interesting one, uh, on the dangers of super efficiency and, uh, and, and a question from Mariana Santos. How to lead people to deliver more and faster in this specific context? Because businesses are requiring uh, extra fast, even more efficiency, even more efficient solutions. They are under pressure. They are under pressure for survival, continuity, and they're demanding from, from their people who, by the way, are at home worried about their children, worried about the, the, the relatives that might get infected and so on. So what's the role here? What's the, what would you advise on, on, on term, for the leaders to, to act? Yeah. You know, I mean, if you're trying to, to come up with all the ideas yourself as a leader to go faster, you're, you're going to fail. Um, but uh, you, need, you need your people's creativity. But, but creativity needs a target. And uh, what is it you want to achieve? But also creativity needs one other thing. It needs a constraint. Because if you have no constraints on time or money or anything, you don't need to be creative because there's enough to do it the normal way. So what I found, when I learned from one of the best leaders I, I work for, he made it very, very clear when we needed to achieve something. And he, he, he said, this is, your, this is what you have to work with. And he, he, he helped us with questions and other things to drive the creativity to do it faster. But you're not going to get the performance from everything unless you make what you need to achieve visible to everybody. Because you're pushing, say, this person to get to this, but you're not, everybody else doesn't know how much pressure this person's under. So they're not, they're not helping them at the right speed. So again, I would say is uh, visibility. The visibility of those, those outcomes you need to achieve and the pace you need 
helps everybody to be more creative. And uh, you know, like I said, you know, you need a clear target and you need some type of constraint. And the biggest constraint that leaders will always do is give you less time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let me focus a little bit now on the outside of the organization. One of the things we have been advising at Porto Business School um, uh, business leaders to, to, to try and, and develop at, at this current pandemic uh, stage is to nurture the relationship with our customers, to protect that relationship, to focus on the, on the safety and well-being also of the customers, not from a transactional perspective, but, perspective, but from a relational perspective. Yeah. You need to protect your customers, treat them well, worry about them, be empathic with them because you need to protect, they will, they will be the ones uh, um, bringing your company out of, out of this. Um, any advices on, on, on now on the, in this more uh, outbound part of the leadership, uh, any advices on, for leaders, how to nurture this relationship with their, with their customers? Yeah, this is a, is a great question. And in fact, uh, in uh, some of the groups I, I, uh, I, I am a part of, that key question came out, you know, because now is not the time to sell. Everybody's going through a lot of different things. Our, our goal as leaders is how can we provide value? How can we provide value to them at this time? Is it uh, uh, just listening? Is it um, some information or is it some guidance or something? Um, you know, one of the consultants said to me, he said, the best way to sell consultancy services is to deliver the service as part of the prospect. <laughs> You know, providing value, and and you know, if you're if you're giving away value, people expect that there's a lot more value behind that, right? And you're you're helping people at the same time. So I think uh, we can't sell at this time. We have to provide value at this time, and then they're going to think of us as someone who could really help them when we come out of this lockdown. Uh, you have been analyzing the situation all over the world uh, with all the companies that you work with, uh, and, and can you can you share a little bit uh, some good examples, good practices? Any company, any leader um, that you have that you feel that are doing particularly well, or that they are doing some things that we need to observe and learn from? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I've been working with uh, different size companies uh, uh, all along. I, I, I really don't know the one particular one doesn't come to mind that they're doing it, uh, you know. Uh, but but the yeah. kinds of practices, perhaps, kind of uh, yeah. things that you have been observing that, uh, that, are, that can constitute good benchmarks. Well, I, I think the, the, the benchmark... Uh, that I've seen with, with the best companies is that their internal communication and their external communication is very consistent. Uh, you know, what they're saying to employees, how they're dealing with their, their suppliers, their customers, all this has been very consistent. The ones I see struggling is when those three are not consistent. Uh, and, and that's, that's the biggest thing I found, which, which for me, it raises a question mark. And if it's a question mark uh, uh, to, to, to me, it's going to be a question mark to other people that way. And I think that's what I found to be really key. We have a question just popped in, and I want to pick it immediately because it connected with the, the now it's not the time to sell, it's the time to uh, deliver value. Uh, Patricia Teixeira-Lopes, our associate dean, um, do you think that providing value now will bring return in the near future? having in mind that companies and individuals will face big financial stress after COVID? Yeah, I, I think so. Because I think if you're providing value, you're listening. So if you're listening, you're seeing the opportunities as to how you can help them uh, after. And, and, and where your services could help them or where other people's services or the timing when your services will be the most appropriate for them as they come out of the lockdown. And so I think, um, you know, the, the quality of the questions you ask your, your customers, your vendors, and everybody else um, is best. Because if you're not asking, you're not understanding their situation thoroughly, you could be offering them something coming out of the lockdown that is just not right for them at that time. 
And, uh, and, you know, a lot of people right now are thinking, oh, what, what uh, proposals could I make? Could I delay the payments? Could I do this? Could I do that? And if you're brainstorming this without listening to people and gaining input, you're, you're going to fail because you're probably going to miss less than 50%. Um, we're, we're fast approaching uh, the end of our of our webinar. We have still 10 minutes, and I have a, a couple of questions still from the audience, but I want to throw this one. Well, what about the aftermath? Um, do you think that organizations that are now, that were now forced to go into a terrible remote adaptation, um, do you think that it will, they will be back to normal or what will be their new normal and how will organizations behave and how will leaders, um, I would say, shape the new organization if there will be one? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to go totally back to where it was. And I think uh, leaders are also going to understand that they have to be much more adaptable and flexible. Um, I was on a, a, a webinar this morning or a group that was uh, dealing with some of the things. And I said, when you come out of this, the best thing you can do is to say, my processes have to be location independent. I have to be able to do business regardless of where people are located. Therefore, I, I can't be relying on paper. I can't be relying on certain things. And um, basically, they said the, the virus did to, to digitalization what it couldn't do by itself. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, but I, I, you know, to be honest, I had this many years ago. The goal I had for my organization was I wanted to be location independent. In other words, if I lost someone in one country, I could use someone from another country or hire in another country for it. And then that is really important. That means that information has to be accessible to all the different places. That means that you have to have a very good uh, training and cross training program and everything. But, but what you're doing is you're making yourself adaptable. And if you're making yourself adaptable as an organization, that means you're creating adaptable people in the organization, which will even go faster. So I think you can't go back to where you were and you need to say, I need to build an organization that's flexible and adaptable. And I has to have a foundation of location independent processes. I love the idea of flexibility and adaptive adaptability. I've been calling it the new organizational Darwinism. It will not be the stronger nor the, nor the most intelligent. It will be the one that adapts the most and, and organizations need to, to focus on that. And, and, and leaders also need to be, they will, they will need to lead that adaptability. Um, if, if, if we think that the, the organization is going, needs to go ambidextrous, uh, the leader needs, needs to go ambidextrous. And they will, the pressure will be, of course, on the execution side, because you will need all the cents and the seconds that allow them to pay the salaries at the end of the month and so on. But the, at the same time, don't you think there are, I, I hate to call it opportunities, but there are spaces that can be filled with new value propositions and new businesses. And, and, and the danger is that leaders that will need to focus on their immediate KPIs, and we all relate to that, and we all know how hard it is, but they might be missing a big opportunity out there if they just do that. So what's your take on the ambidextrous leader right now in the aftermath of this pandemic? Yeah, yeah. You know, the leader has leadership has to be an and, right? Like what you're saying, you have to deliver today, and you have to create the future, right? You have to be you have to lead with your head, but you have to have a heart as well. And so you you have to do, to do both. I think uh, I think the the an interesting one is each of the leaders have to say where are our opportunities? Where do, where could we be? What are the possibilities? And have a, a brainstorm around those things. But you know, it's an interesting thing that that I found sometimes with people who really adapt to change is they're willing to change their mind. Think about it. If, if some people say, well, I never changed my mind on this. Well, probably you never grown or you've never thought about the, the situation in the same way. So a good thing is, is, is to challenge our mindsets and say, is our, is our own leadership mindsets holding our organization back where we're discounting something because we think it's not, 
possible, but probably there, it, it could be possible. Uh, I'm working with a, with a resort in southern Spain right now doing a leadership program. And he's basically uh, instructed a, a subset of his organization to say, what does the future look like in terms of service, the experience? And, and how are we going to enable that digitally and everything else in terms of it? So I think, you know, there always has to be something of building the future at the same time of delivering the day. And the leader has to be balancing those two all the time. So if you're, you can't say I'm going to deliver today for the next six months and then uh, I'm going to worry about the future six months later because every day you delay, you're delaying the future, which means that the, a leader has to be, uh, uh, how would you say, organized enough to keep both conflicting, what could be a conflicting thought in their head, but still take action. Uh, well, I, I don't resist reading here. It's not a question, it's a comment, but it's regarding the benchmarks and companies that have been doing well. There's a comment here from uh, Renan Rosario Fernandes saying that Itaú, the bank in Brazil, Itaú has been developing interesting initiatives during this outbreak crisis. It became more human oh. when uh, the approach goes to market. And even the CEO is closer to the employees, is closer to the... Yeah. To the so it, it's quite interesting to understand that uh, we, we, we start... Uh, uh, understanding and observing in companies uh, despite the physical distancing and the remote that we all thought that was de dehumanizing organizations perhaps it's humanizing them it's humanizing the leader also a lot of people are saying that you know we're we're we're, we're taking into account much more of the human factor uh, a lot of leaders i've been talking to is that they're asking a lot more questions about uh, their people. Uh, one of them had a had a like a virtual get together with absolutely no business and just saying how are we doing and 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 people were talking. But the, you, the, your comment made made an interesting one. Is that in my my studies, my working with people, and my reading, some of the best companies have their CEOs in the marketplace at least a day a week. You know, they're with customers and everything at least a day a week, always as a religion. You know, I'm going to block off a day here because the more the more you put uh, a human face to to uh, what the numbers are, the more you treat the numbers with more of a human way as well. Yeah. Yeah, we are really close to the end. And um, I, I'm going to read a question here from Pilar Moraes that came up very early in the show, but I really and left it uh, till the end because you know you you got us used to pick your brain very often you share a lot with us so let us pick your brain what are you reading what are you writing what is the thing on your mind right now um, or the thing or the things on your mind right now of course yeah i mean uh, over the last few years i've been uh, i've been working on uh, learning more about influence and I brought a lot more influence factors and techniques, and I give them all my students a sort of a one pager of all the different influence factors. But the thing I'm working on now, and I'm probably still another year till I can actually deliver it, is, and especially now uh, uh, in our world we have, we're so information rich and knowledge poor because we we're just bombarded. And I found this is that. The best leaders are the ones that have the ability to shape people's perspectives and perceptions because we don't have enough time to learn all the details of something. We learn a few facts and then suddenly we make a perception of it and that's reality to us based on a few facts. So the key thing that I'm working on now is what are all the different behaviors that allow you to shape someone's perspective or perception on something, because that's where you have the biggest influence in a crazy world where information is, uh, what is it, doubling every minute now or something. I don't know, but it's crazy. Yeah, That's the things I'm working on now. Well, I, I couldn't think of a better wrap up to our webinar. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time, for sharing your wisdom as usual. Uh, I want to thank our audience, uh, everybody up there. Uh, don't forget that this webinar will remain in our YouTube channel, um, available for uh, uh, um, 
for, for, for you to see it again, for you to share it with your friends. Also, don't forget that ne next Thursday, we have uh, the Dean's Lounge. Our Dean, Ramona Callaghan, is inviting uh, um, the former Dean of Rotterdam School of Management, uh, Stefan van der, uh, van der Peel, van der Peel, sorry. Um, it will be a great, a great, uh, a great uh, webinar, and he has so many interesting stories. You know, he, 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 he got caught in the middle of Peru, when the pandemic struck and he had to, well, that's an amazing story. It's next Thursday at 6 p.m. Porto time on your on our YouTube channel. And beyond now, we'll be back next Tuesday. Mark, once again, thank you so much. Stay safe, my friend. And we'll, hopefully we see each other soon at Porto Business School. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Stay thank safe, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.